We now begin a unit on the animal defenses against microbes. As you've learned throughout this semester, microorganisms are very good at figuring out how to grow almost everywhere. If we did not have an effective immune system to fight against these guys, we wouldn't last a minute. And this is clearly shown in individuals that have mutations that leave them without an immune system. If they are not carefully protected from all the microorganisms in the environment, they very quickly succumb to infection and die. In this unit, I want to warn you and tell you that it's incredibly complex. So there's lots of terms, there's lots of intertwined stuff that where each one system cooperates with another, etc. So you're going to hear things before I've explained them. And that's just the nature of the beast and we have to go through that. Be patient with yourself. To help with this, I've opened up chapters in the textbook based on immunology. Please read these. It's free for everyone to read. It will really help you to understand the process. Here are the learning outcomes. Let us begin. The immune system is a complex combination of cells and organs that protect you from microorganisms. It prevents the growth of undesirable microbes in unwanted areas. It's also amazingly good at this. Humans can live for almost 100 years, even in the face of all the pathogens that challenge them. Your immune system can be organized into two broad categories. Innate immunity, which are structures that are always present and do not increase significantly with exposure, and acquired immunity that adapts to the pathogens that challenge it and increases in intensity over time. Innate immunity has two major players, phagocytes and the inflammatory response. Acquired immunity consists of two major branches, antibody-mediated immunity involving B cells and cell-mediated immunity, CMI, involving T cells. Let's begin right away with some preconceptions. The immune system is found mostly in the blood and circulatory system, true or false? The answer is false. 70% of the immune system is our, in our digestive tract and many other parts are in the lymph system. In fact, while the circulatory system is involved in the immune system, there's other parts of it that are larger. Okay, first of all, let's go through an introduction of the immune system. One of the major things that the immune system must be able to do is identify self. The immune system must differentiate self from non-self. Now you might think that, come on, it's obvious to tell the difference between a pathogen or an unwanted microbe and a human, but this is actually difficult at the molecular level. And remember, we're all made of the same things, proteins, sugars, and lipids, and nucleic acids. The immune system has to be able to tell the difference between something you make and something that's dangerous. For example, lysozyme is something you make, so you wouldn't want to protect yourself against that. But tetanus toxin is definitely something you'd want to protect yourself from. The immune system creates lymphocytes that respond to many different macromolecules. When created, they collectively respond to both self and non-self. And when I mean self, I mean the protein, sugars, and lipids floating around that are part of our body and are accessible to the immune system. We've got to be able to differentiate between these two things, and we do, and you're going to learn about how we do that. Another important concept, antigens. Antigens are any type of molecule that causes an immune response in a host by interacting with antigen-specific receptors on the membrane of host lymphocytes. Proteins are by far the strongest antigens. Sugars are next, but they're not as strong antigens. Then there's lipopolysaccharides, which are very weak, and then lipids and DNA are not good antigens at all. So most of the antigens that your body is gonna to respond to are proteins or are derived from proteins. The immune system itself is a complex network of organs and tissues. And there is extensive interdependence of the players in the system and they communicate with each other and they work together to defend you against microorganisms. Tissues of the immune system fall into two groups based upon their role in immune defense. 
First, there are the primary tissues. These tissues create the cells of the immune system. They educate the cells of the immune system. Examples of these tissues include the bone marrow, which is where all immune system cells originate, the thymus gland, and the mucus-associated lymphoid tissue. There is also the secondary or peripheral immune tissues. These look after mature cells that are an active part of defense. Uh, these include things like the spleen, which also has a role in the primary defense, the lymphatic system, lymph nodes, and the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue or malt. Okay, let's see if you've been listening. Which tissues play, which tissue plays both a primary and secondary role in the immune system? The body has two vascular systems, true or false? The correct answer is malt. The correct answer is true. It's called the lymph system. And the lymph system is throughout your body and monitors it to check for infections. And we'll talk more about that in later lectures. After that brief introduction, it's time to start talking about innate immunity. Innate immunity recognizes things in your body that are foreign. It then reacts against them and tries to eliminate them. So what's recognized? First of all, MAMPs, which are microbe associated molecular patterns. These are things like bacterial peptidoglycan, lipoproteins, lipotyclotic acids, lipopolysaccharide, fungal mannose, viral envelope proteins, bacterial flagellin, and it used to be called the pathogen associated molecular pattern or PAMPs, but we've now realized that it recognizes more than just these patterns on pathogens. It also recognizes them on all microorganisms. Another thing it innate immunity will recognize is DAMPs, which are danger-associated molecular patterns. When these come up, they indicate a cell is injured. And this will initiate an immune response to a non-infectious agent. Examples include heat shock proteins, nuclear DNA, ATP, and uric acid. If you're seeing these things, in the general tissues of the body, it means there's damaged cells around and the body needs to respond to repair the damage. So how does it do this? It uses something called pattern recognition receptors or PRR. These, this is a family of receptors present on immune cells. These proteins are encoded in the host genes and they are expressed on phagocytes, dendritic cells, epithelial cells, endothelial cells, and some lymphocytes. And again, we'll explain a lot of these terms that I'm throwing around as we go through this. They will recognize macromolecules made by microbes. So in a macrophage, activation of PRR causes induction of the inflammatory response. There are 12 different PRRs in mammals and they're pictured here on the right. And as an example, you'll see that these PRRs like TLR1 or TLR2 heterodimer this recognizes lipopolysaccharide, lipotycholic acid, and peptidoglycan. This must be from a microorganism, and that could spell trouble for the body. So you want to detect and react to that. Another example is TLR8. And this is a PRR that recognizes single-stranded RNA, as does TLR7. And this will then react to this and cause a response. PRs are proteins that recognize common structures that are found in microorganisms. List the PRRs that you think would respond to a COVID-19 infection. Since the COVID-19 virus is a coronavirus, it has a single-stranded positive RNA. And if you go back and look at this table, you'll see that TLR8 and TLR7 are the ones that respond to single-stranded RNA. So these are probably the ones that the coronavirus would, the PRRs that would recognize the coronavirus. It turns out there's lots of cell types that are involved in this. And all of these are called white blood cells because they, many of them were first observed in the blood and they weren't red. So they called them white blood cells. 
Many of the cells of the immune system originate from bone marrow stem cells. Cytokines, small peptide hormones, dictate the fate of the bone marrow stem cell and will determine its differentiation path. The stem cell will differentiate into a lymphoid precursor cell, which then matures in either, either a T cell or a B cell. Bone marrow stem cells can also differentiate into a myeloid precursor cell, which will then mature into mast cells, monocytes, or polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Since I don't like saying polymorphonuclear leukocytes all the time, I'm going to call them neutrophils, which is another name for them. Okay, so this is how, how these all originate in the bone marrow. Now this isn't all the cells that can be made from bone marrow stem cells that are involved in the immune system, but these are some of the major players and we'll be discussing most of them as we go through these lectures. The innate immune system is your first line of defense against the pathogen. The innate immune system must be circumvented before a pathogen can enter a host and cause harm. The adaptive immune system is only activated after the innate immune system has been breached in most cases. Previously, it was thought that the innate immune system played a small role in slowing a pathogen and the adaptive immune system was the major force in immunity. Recent findings reveal that the innate immune system plays a more significant role and can often thwart a pathogen all by itself. So now we're going to talk about the different systems that are involved in the innate immune system. The first one, and a very important one, is the epithelial barriers, the skin. Skin is a very effective barrier to microbes. First, the hair on your skin will prevent pathogens access to it. Skin itself is composed of tightly packed, heavily keratinized cells that are difficult to penetrate. It is hydrophobic and dry, which if you remember module six, microbes cannot deal with easily. They don't do well in dry environments, and this is especially true of many pathogens. Sebaceous glands throughout the skin secrete hydrophobic oils, and epithelial cells produce peptide antibiotics. If a microbe survives this array of defenses against it, the, con the skin constantly sheds, causing the attached microbes to be lost. So even if you get through all of this stuff and you finally establish a beachhead, the skin cell will flake off and you'll fall off with it. Another physical barrier is the movement of body parts. Humans can move, and this movement is not just to get them from one place to another, but it can act as an antimicrobial agent. Some examples include blinking, which sweeps microbes out of the eye, cilia in the throat and lungs constantly beat upward and move microbes out, and the peristaltic action of the GI tract pushes microbes through the gastrointestinal tract. Finally, the flow of urine washes microbes from the urethra. A chemical barrier that cells have is antimicrobial secretions. The body makes a number of antimicrobial compounds and they are described in this table. For example, lysozyme, as we've talked about in previous lectures, is secreted in serum, saliva, sweat, and tears, and it will lyse cells. Basic proteins and polypeptides will bind to membranes and disrupt them. Your cell makes these specifically, things like beta lysins and other cationic proteins. Lactoferrin and transferrin are enzymes and proteins that specifically bind and sequester iron, keeping this essential element away from pathogens. Peroxidase is in saliva tissue in various cells, such as neutrophils, and this will act to make peroxide, which is lethal and causes lethal oxidations. And finally, fibronectin will bind to bacteria and assist in their clearance by phagocytes. Another enzymatic system that helps you defend against pathogens is the complement system. This is an enzymatic system that contains nine important proteins from C1 through C9. It's produced in macrophages and liver cells and by epithelial cells in the gastrointestinal mucosa. This will circulate in the bloodstream until activated. When it is activated, it is like setting off a landmine that destroys the microorganisms. 
The complement cascade can be set off in three different ways. In the classic pathway, binding of an antibody to a target cell will unmask a region on the antibody that the C1 complement protein recognizes, forming a complex. This complex then sets off the rest of the cascade. Activation of complement does not always need antibodies. A small amount of C3 complement protein can continually converts through a series of reactions to a semi-active form and then associates with nearby membranes. If it settles on a host membrane, the host has proteins that reverse the complex and prevent further activation. However, if this, if this semi-activated C3 complex enters a pathogen's membrane, the complex continues down the cascade and activates the entire system. Complement also activates by a third pathway. Many pathogens will display polysaccharides on their surface that contain the sugar mannose. This sugar is not present on hosts. Our immune system produces a mannose binding lectin that will recognize these sugars and along with two other proteins will imitate the C1 complex. This mannose complex then interfaces with C2 and starts the complement cascade. The result is that any pathogen surface displaying mannose will trip the complement landmines and doom itself to attack. Right, so you have these three pathways. The classic pathway with antibodies, this alternative pathway where it binds to pathogen sur surfaces and then activates, and then the mannose binding protein lectin pathway. So once this gets activated, it then activates C3 which splits into C3B and C3A. This then binds C5 and hydrolyzes it into C5A and C5B. C5B then binds with C6, C7, C8, and C9, and this creates a pore in the microbial plasma membrane, and then the contents begin to leak out. So what happens when this cascade gets triggered and amplified and you start making all these pores in, in cellular membranes. First, C3A and C5A are chemoattractants for phagocytes, and that will bring them to the area. So it's a signal that there's something bad going on. Second, C3A and C5A bind to the mast cells and induce inflammation, which is something we'll talk about in the next lecture. C3B, which is bound to the pathogen, is an opsonin. Again, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. C5B, C6, C7, C8, and C9 form a pore, as I just talked about in the membrane, punch holes into it, and then C8 and C9 form a phospholipase and start digesting this microbial membrane. So the complement cascade is incredibly powerful and incredibly deadly when it's tripped off. We end this lecture with a quicker question. Which microbial feature might help protect against lysis by complement? And the answer is a polysaccharide capsule because you could hide the membrane and anything that the antibodies might recognize or you know any of the other systems from being detected by complement. Okay, that's it for this lecture.